This is the story of how war turned into peace in what is now the most important part of the world. It's the story of how a group of researchers asked new questions. Instead of asking why do they fight, they ask how come they stopped fighting. We hope that our research will help young Asians realize how much they benefit from peace. They have a much better chance than their parents and their grandparents had to uh, improve their lives, to form their own future, and also to fight against injustice and repression with peaceful means. For a long time, and not so long ago, the world's most deadly wars happened in just one region, East Asia. It consists of China, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, and the 10 Southeast Asian countries. From the Opium War around 1840 until the Sino-Vietnamese War in 1979, there were countless outbreaks of war, both between states and within states. Of all the people killed in wars in the world between 1946 and 1979, a stunning 80% were killed in East Asia. The region was a powder keg. Then, in 1979, something happened. The figures dropped. The countries stopped fighting each other. And you also had fewer internal wars. And if we look at the period since 1989, only 3.6% of those killed in the whole world have been killed in East Asia. This is, this is really puzzling. It's something that we researchers want to understand. How can it be that the region suddenly makes a transition, a change, from a situation of widespread warfare into a situation of peace? Since making its turn to peace, East Asia has seen an enormous growth in prosperity and welfare. In less than two generations, it has become the leading economic region in the world. East Asians live longer, are healthier and better educated, and have a standard of living that is unmatched in history. This could not have happened without peace. East Asia and China have grown in peace and because of peace. The Norwegian historian Stein Turneson leads the East Asian Peace Programme at Uppsala University in Sweden. For six years, he and his group of 25 researchers from Europe, Asia and America have tried to answer two questions. First, how come East Asia, with such a bloody history, suddenly stopped waging wars? And second, how stable is the peace? Every local outbreak of war in the whole world is registered in the powerful database UCDP at Uppsala University. The trigger for registration is if 25 people or more are killed in one year. Conflicts that are still violent in East Asia are followed closely, for example, in the Patani region between Thailand and Malaysia. The database reveals patterns that would otherwise be hidden. I think absolutely important, I think, for scholars from all the regions to come together to study East, East Asian peace, not just, uh, you know, scholars from East Asia. You know, scholars don't have the excuse of only speaking to the very small group of people who share their ideology or who share their methodological dogma. Um, and it forces you to think much harder about how to explain what your research is about um, why it's important, right, um, and why other people should care. Young Asians today tend to take the peace for granted, and who can blame them? They do not remember the Korean War or the Vietnam War. It did not happen in their lifetime. But they should realize that historically, the peace in their time is unique. It's exceptional. As a historian, Stein Turneson knows that memories of war tend to play tricks with our minds. We tend to forget the most severe ones and remember those that are the most humiliating. The Taiping Rebellion in China, for instance, in the mid-19th century, cost more lives than the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. Many Chinese today do not even know about the Taiping Rebellion, but they've all heard about the much smaller Opium Wars because they were so humiliating to the Chinese nation. The European and American colonization of Southeast Asia cost hundreds of thousands of lives in a series of wars. Japan learned from the Europeans and invaded most of its neighbors. Then came the Second World War with millions of casualties. The war ended in Europe, 
but in East Asia, the killing continued. A number of wars followed that made East Asia the biggest battlefield in the entire world. There was the Civil War in China and the wars in Korea and Vietnam. East Asia became an arena for proxy wars by the Americans, Chinese and Soviets. Then followed the atrocities in Cambodia, Vietnam's occupation of Cambodia and China's five-week invasion of northern Vietnam. And suddenly there was peace. How did that happen? There are different theories about this. Let me tell you what I think. I think it has to do with national priorities and leadership. One Asian leader after the other took the decision to give priority to economic growth. The basic idea was make money, not war. And when a sufficient number of leaders had taken that decision, the whole region became more peaceful. Japan was first. In 1945, it was a nation in ruins and had to form a new government. Uh, the Japanese decided to embrace defeat. They did not seek revenge. Uh, they did not seek to build up their military again, but they adopted a peace constitution which prevented or, or prohibited Japan from ever engaging in war again and from having an army. This was written into the famous Article 9 of the Japanese constitution. Japan's peace constitution, which was imposed onto the country despite resistance, soon turned out to be a blessing and formed the background for the so-called Yoshida Doctrine. When the US urged Japan to assist in the Korean War a few years later, the Japanese government refused. Instead, the country focused on economic growth. Japan created a model. In the 1960s, South Korea followed and gave priority to its economic growth, just as Japan had done, and downplayed the policies of confrontation towards North Korea. Several other countries followed. Indonesia abandoned previous confrontations with its neighbours and launched a growth-promoting policy. Indonesia also laid the groundwork for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, known as ASEAN, together with Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand and the Philippines and Taiwan got rich while dropping its ambition of winning back the Chinese mainland. But what about the biggest nation, China? While the Vietnam War raged, China expected a third world war and Mao Zedong launched the Cultural Revolution. It was a humanitarian as well as an economic disaster, which set China even further back. Only after Mao had died in 1976 did the Chinese leaders really realise how far they were lagging behind other countries in the region. And then the change came. A new leader, Deng Xiaoping, came to power and he carried out market economic reforms and he studied the examples of Japan and Korea. He also went himself to Japan in December 1978 and said, China does not just wish for peace, it needs peace in its neighborhood in order to modernize. That was the dawn of the economic miracle in China. For Vietnam, it took another decade before the same thing happened. In 1986, it decided to give priority to economic growth. And in 1989, Vietnam withdrew its troops from Cambodia when they stopped getting military aid from the Soviet Union. And then Vietnam also started to grow economically like the others. All these policy changes have three things in common. First, the leaders decided to put economic growth first and therefore to have stability. They needed peace in order to get economic growth. Second, they all wanted to have good relations with the United States because they needed US investments, US technology and access to the American market. And third, they all learned from Japan they followed the Japanese example, the Japanese model. So who can be surprised that Japan's Article 9 has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize? But does everyone agree that the East Asian peace was created by a few national leaders? No. Um, in our research program, we are trying to develop many different and rival hypotheses or theories about what explains the East Asian peace. There are some who think that 
the peace is mainly due to economic interdependence. This theory is called the capitalist peace. The more trade, investments and division of labour you have between countries, the more costly it would be to go to war. Some explain the absence of war with the superpowers' withdrawal from the region. Several countries outside the region, in particular the US, China, Soviet Union, kept sending weapons and support to the governments and the rebels in the region. They shifted their priorities and started instead encouraging all these parties to engage in negotiations and peace settlements. When the US, China and the Soviet Union stopped waging wars by proxy, the death tolls in the region fell sharply. Others argue that the peace is instead a product of international law. A number of treaties and agreements have made it possible to solve disputes without weapons. There is also the ASEAN way. By putting the conflicts aside, the original member states have avoided war with each other for almost 50 years. And today ASEAN also includes Vietnam, Brunei, Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar. Each of these explanations has something to say for itself, but I don't think they are sufficient. I think that the only thing that really prevents nations from going to war is when leaders give top priority to the economic well-being of the nation. War is a risky business and I think those who are willing to take that enormous risk are mainly leaders who are motivated by ideology, strong nationalism or fear of losing power. So in a world of turmoil, East Asia still remains a relatively peaceful exception. But what about the second question? How deep is the peace? Unfortunately, it does not seem very stable or deep. There are a lot of conflicts still simmering that have been there for a long time. They have been left unresolved. There is also still ongoing civil war in some countries, like the Philippines, Thailand and Myanmar. And there are growing nationalist sentiments in the region. There is a danger, a risk now, that East Asian states uh, are reverting to past tensions that could lead to past conflicts. Uh, and this is something we want to avoid. But the peace also depends on attitudes among the common people. According to political scientist and core group member Erlin Bionagod, the quality of the peace is closely related to human security and violent sentiments among people. If human insecurity persists despite the relative peacefulness, I would argue that this means that the East Asian peace is fairly shallow in the sense that it's only related to the absence of battle deaths and armed conflict. Do people feel safe? Are women free from harassment? Are minorities tolerated? That's not what we find in our surveys. Violent thoughts may lead to violent actions, and the research concludes that attitudes are crucial factors for preserving the peace. It is also important that the traumas of war are not hidden. The East Asian region has a tradition of forgetting the uh, legacy of mass atrocities and human rights violations that have been committed, and they've largely been swept under the rug. When the past is not addressed in some manner, conflict has the potential to re-emerge because grievances and mistrust can continue to fester. This nurtures feelings of aggressive nationalism, but what about the young Asians today? Does their new high standard of living prevent them from such feelings? Not really. Young people learn at school about the misdeeds done by others. They learn to blame others instead of blaming war. So many young nationalists are now saying, we used to be poor, but now we are rich and strong, so we can take back those islands we lost in the past. Numerous articles and books have been and will be published as a result of the research. But the biggest achievement might be forming an argument for peace that will convince the young Asian public. Please remember that this century is the Asian century. The future of world peace is decided in Asia and mainly in East Asia, which is the engine of the world economy today. The countries of East Asia are deeply integrated with each other economically and also with Europe and the United States. So the future of world peace is decided in East Asia. 
in my own research and others as well, I've shown that non-violent conflicts are largely more effective than armed uprisings in getting their result. Our findings indicate that domestic violence can make people more likely to participate in political violence and thus uh, be a cause of war. In the immediate aftermath of armed conflict, it can be beneficial to avoid justice and reconciliation processes, but this is not a long-term solution. Being in a program with different competing theories, I think, has been really useful because it means that we constantly re-evaluate um, both our starting points and our conclusions and everything is open for discussion. To me it's a, it's a very big freedom uh, in, in conducting research like this and in having the whole program being designed in a way that enables us to do this.